were destroyed in a huge fire. In 1944, there was a glimmer of hope in the war. The Department of Education under the Nationalist government set up a committee for cultural relics in the war zone, appointing Liang Zichung vice chairman. During this time, he was responsible for compiling a detailed list of all cultural relics in the war zone. All the names on this list were dear to the heart of this researcher. The list later became the basis for the inventory of all relics that were to be protected in the new China. Another important job for Liang was to compile a list of cultural relics in the North China and coastal regions for the 14th Air Force of the United States. These were marked on military maps so to as avoid destruction during the war. Liang earnestly gave the same designation to the old Japanese cities of Kyoto and Nara. These days, it might be hard to understand that during the worst of times with the war raging, a group of Chinese scholars persisted with their groundbreaking work. On the upper reaches of the Yangtze River, in the small town of Lijiang, Scholars from the Institute of History and Philology created the academic masterpiece, Assorted Essays in the Midst of Poverty and Illness. It covered topics in history, archaeology, literature, linguistics, ethnology, folklore, and anthropology. Most of these essays later became the building blocks of their respective disciplines and almost all of the scholars were leaders in their fields. During this period of exile in the wilderness, their academic pursuits kept them alive. In 1945, five years after Liang and Lin came to Lijuang, we find in their letters a new kind of anticipation, full of hope. Dearest Wilma, we have just received the exciting telegram telling us that you are actually in New Delhi. The reality of such an event is hard to grasp at first, though we had talked of nothing else for these last ten years of your suddenly coming back to us. The children are so grown now that there are now four of the Liangs awaiting your arrival with equal intensity. Dear darling Wilma, a year ago this is D-Day. This year we received news that you would be in Chongqing by the 10th, and 10th is my birthday. When all this adds up, it means one thing. You are coming, and we are in a celebrating mood. Dearest Aunt Wilma, I have got your dear letter. Both Mammy and I were so happy that we nearly shed tears. As you see, I'm learning to typewrite. I'm typing this letter myself instead of writing. This typewriter ribbon is given us by a man called John Fairbank. Perhaps you know him. He was a very nice man when he was here. Mammy is still pretty and young, but she thinks that she is getting old and ugly. I often argue with her. I'm sure that when you come here, you will take my side. In May 1945, Wilma Fairbank came to Chongqing in the capacity of cultural attaché at the American Embassy. Ten years ago on Christmas morning 1935, Liang Sichong and Phyllis and Lao Jin were all at the Tiananmen station to say goodbye to us as we left China. Last week, on the 3rd of July 1945, Su Chung was at the airport to welcome me back, as Lao Jin had already done in Kunming. One evening soon after arriving in Chongqing, 
Wilma Fairbank was sitting at the doorstep of the embassy chatting with Liang Suchong and two young writers when suddenly... Suddenly he stopped talking. He and the others stiffened into a vigilant tenseness, almost like hunting dogs. I had to strain my ears to hear what they had heard. It was the faraway sound of a siren. Could it be an air raid? Preposterous, and yet each of them was alert for the possibility after years of conditioning to the real thing. Could it instead be signaling the victory? Very quickly, the news of victory spread like wildfire around the whole city. was over. Lin Huiyin's way of celebrating the victory was to ride a carrying chariot made of bamboo to the local tea house with Wilma by her side. Despite her six years in Lijuang, Lin Huiyin had hardly even reached the Lijuang County seat half a mile away. I went to town again by chair and took a boat punted by two of Taiping's boyfriend and went to a restaurant for noodles and setting another tea house to get a rest and returning by way of the football field and watched a volleyball match from a tea shed, on the bank, etc. I also visited Taiping School the day before wearing slack and very elegant and caused a sensation. A poem they had taught their children during the hard times in Lijuang now appeared in front of their eyes. 见外呼传收寄北出文涕泪满衣裳却看妻子愁何在漫卷诗书喜欲狂白日放歌须纵酒青春作伴好还乡即从八霞穿乌霞便下襄阳想洛阳 in December 1945, Wilma Fairbank arranged for Lin to leave Lichuang, where she had been living for five years, and go to Chongqing. Wilma took Lin around by jeep to watch movies, to see the school where her son was studying, and to dine in the mess hall of the American Embassy. There, she would excitingly engage in discussions with the Allies, and even take part in a meeting between the Communists and the Nationalists held at the News Bureau of the Embassy. The Liangs are here. Phyllis is out of her room in Lichuang for the first time in five years. She walked into our living room and gasped. It's just like walking into a magazine. For it is only in magazines that she has seen open fires and shaded lights in these last years. Everything is new and exciting to her and she constantly keeps her eyes peeled for the new dresses and books and paintings and all the sights of this, to her, great city of Chongqing. Unfortunately, all this doesn't mean that she is better. I took Dr. Eloeser to see her, a famous chest surgeon, and he told me that both lungs are involved, as well as the kidney, and that it is just a matter of a few years, perhaps five, before her brief but vivid life must come to an end. Still, she is full of vivacity and responsive to all facets of life and will probably be that way to the end. <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音> 又什么时候，心才真能懂得这时间的距离，山河的年岁。<音>